I'd like you to look at Acts chapter 6 right here with me. I don't know if you know it. You'll probably see it as we study along here. But the book of Acts grows in lurches. They will, the church will go linearly like a, a general and his troops conquering as they go. And then they'll hit a sticking point. You saw it in chapter 4 whenever the government rose up and said, you will speak no more in this name. And so all of a sudden in chapter 4, we stopped. And they had, to, they had a problem with persecution. And they decided that they would obey God, not men. And they would pray, and the earth was shaken, and the grace of God came down, and they grew. They grew along until chapter 5, and we had a problem not outside the church, but inside Ananias and Sapphira. We had sin with a high hand in the church against God. And uh, we solved that. We had a double funeral, if you remember. And then we moved on until chapter 6. We're going to have a problem in chapter 11. We're going to have a problem in chapter 15. But we're going to have a problem here in chapter 6. The, the, the New Testament church isn't that it doesn't have problems, but it knows how to deal with them. They have problems just like we do. They're going to have a problem here, and it's not going to be in persecution. It's not going to be merely in sin. It's going to be in social problems. They're going to have a social one. And it's going to be a problem that is not just historic. It is prophetic of what is going to happen to all churches. Because we're going to have people starting to come to Christ now. Verse 1, when the disciples were increasing in number. We're going to have a problem in chapter 10 and 11 when Peter goes to a Gentile. And in chapter 13 and 14, when Paul goes to an entire subcontinent of Gentiles. So as they grow, Christianity is not a religion for a certain country. It is a religion of, of neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor freeman, male nor female, but Christ is all. We're going to have all types of people. Men, women, young, old, Jew, Gentile, Scythian, barbarian, slave, and freeman, Paul will say. And we're going to bring into the faith different biases that are cultural. And we're going to have a problem in recognizing what is culture and what is Christian dogma, what you baptize as absolute, and what is your personal preference. Can that ever be a problem in a church? Only in those filled with humans. Yeah. Now, if, if you had Spock commenting on the church, and I'm not talking about the doctor, but the Vulcan, all right? Spock was always the guy in Star Trek that was cold rationale, all right? And uh, he, he would say, Captain, Captain... <laughs> We're going to have a problem, granted what Christianity is, that this is a belief where all are equal in Christ and yet all men are not the same. You're going to have guys that have different diet codes, have different um, feelings on certain things, and you're going to have them coexist. Captain, we're going to have a problem. And what we're going to have is we're going to have all these different guys baptizing their personal biases and calling them Christian and people are going to butt up against them we're going to have some complaints arising well while the disciples are increasing in number just write down there goes the neighborhood all of a sudden we're going to have people join that and, and that we are not ready for uh, in a sense Denton Bible got born out of this when Mel Summerall took a church uh, full of uh, greatest generation guys and they started growing and they had young guys coming and they had never seen young guys and they were different people and all of a sudden a problem arose and calcification set in. Ossification. Is anybody with me on that? It, it became a thorny, bony structure that wouldn't give. It got arteriosclerosis. Anybody with me? 
their arteries hardened and they would not give. And so uh, it, you ended up with a break off over very non-biblical things that old guys could not handle. Severe doctrinal problems like Kool-Aid on the rug. That's how Denton Bible got born. All right. And so we have here in verse 1, Hellenists and Hebrews. Y'all know what that means? The Hellenic is the Greek, as in Helen of Troy. Okay. And so Hellenic Jews are those that are Jews of the diaspora, that are of the dispersion. Whenever they came back under Babylon after they had been scattered, you nevertheless had Jews that didn't come back, and you had a great number of Jews outside of the confines of the land of Canaan. And they were Jews outside of their native culture. And they began to speak Greek. And they got a very, we would say, in a, not, a non, a, not a bad sense, a very worldly attitude. They weren't just stringent Jews. It would be like when you, is there a difference between a Jew in Miami and a Jew in Jerusalem? Yeah, minor differences. Yeah, they're, they may be both Jews. They may even believe the same, but they're different types guys because one's the home team and one isn't. And so they had a different outlook and specifically on the temple. Uh, Jewish life in Jerusalem centers on that little quadrangle of the temple. What do you do if you're in uh, Cyprus? Or if you're in Tarsus of Cilicia, you all know another famous Jew that grew up in Tarsus of Cilicia, the Apostle Paul. How do you do temple worship when you're 700 miles from the temple? What you do is you evolve a Judaism that frankly would be more New Testament, that it's going to put a recognition that God doesn't dwell in the temple made with hands. He abides in the praises of his people. And they got a more spiritual, as it were, attitude toward Christianity. That's why, to get ahead of myself, in verse 7, you see something you haven't seen. Priests are coming to the faith. That, and this probably is on right anticipating verse 8 and following. Stephen, who is a Hellenist, and Philip, who is a Hellenist begin preaching that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. And it's probably at this point that you're starting to see the priesthood beginning to convert to Christianity as the Hellenic Christians begin to say to them what the native Hebrew Christians probably were not willing to say, that the priesthood is now obsolete. They will now say, and possibly the guy that writes the book of Hebrews is Hellenic and begins to say that what, is, uh, what was is now becoming old and obsolete and ready to disappear. It was a Hellenic type of Jew that would say that. And so the faith is about to get a big surge, a big tidal wave is going to hit it, and it's going to go in chapter 8 down into Samaria. You know who's going to take it? It's not the native Hebrews. It's Philip and it's Stephen that have this more broad-minded attitude of where worship is, that it's now tear down this temple in three days I'll raise it up. It's the body of Christ. The earlier Jews probably didn't make that break. These guys will. They're going to be one of the great blessings of the faith. But the native Hebrews don't see it that way. And so they simply look up and they say, these newcomers are not our kind. They're not like us. And as a result, in verse 1, a complaint arose. The widows were being overlooked. The native Hebrews, these 5,000 plus, are the major contingency. They're the majority. And when the money was taken and doled out to the, the, the widows of the church, little sermon in a sermon, by this time the church is beginning to have its own substructure. They're no longer merely part of Israel. They're beginning to organize on their own. 
the meiosis is beginning to take place. Is that meiosis? I think it is. It's starting to take place. Okay. And as a result, the native, or rather the, uh, the Hellenic Jews are overlooked. We're not going to take care of them. How come? It's called bigotry. It's called prejudice. This has always been the Achilles heel. It's what Spock would have said to Captain Kirk. You're going to have a problem with this. Because all of these guys are not from the same zip code. And they're going to bring in all kind of attitudes. Y'all remember Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 8, eating meat, sacrificed to idols, observing one day above another? That's a Jew-Gentile problem. And so Paul had to deal with this in his day. You remember whenever they send out the letter in Acts 15 that says, by the grace of the Lord Jesus are we saved even as the rest. However, you Gentiles, be careful about eating food, sacrificed to idols, and eating blood because you got Jews that have a problem with this. And so they are always having to navigate and negotiate the cultural phenomena of all different kind of guys, the United Nations coming together in the faith. It's a problem. And so here, it's about time for it to rise up. So they're going to have to deal with it. Well, what happened at verse 1 is a complaint. It's the Greek word gongusma. You know what it means? Nothing. Doesn't mean anything. It's an onomatopoeia. It just sounds like what was going on. It's a word for grumbling. Gongusma, Kendall Lucas. <laughs> just grumbling and griping. Can that ever happen in churches? Grumbling. Over doctrine? No. Over truth? No. Over holiness? No. It's over people that don't look like us. They don't talk like us. They don't sound like us. We got a problem. This happened in Israel. Way up in the north, they put a Roman battalion up there. And the people that lived up there became more Romanized. They couldn't get down as much into Jerusalem. They developed their own speech pattern. And they were from a place called Nazareth. What's the most famous verse you think of? We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? That was a, an old Jewish adverb, all right? Proverb, all right? That they're different from us. So it happens. Bigotry knows no, you know, genealogical boundary. I mean, every people have it. Heck, you ever heard of Sunnis and Shiites? Even Muslims will kill each other, all right, over uh, a, a minor issue as to who takes charge. Is it Muhammad's descendants or is it a representative guy? That's Sunni and Shiite. And they've been killing each other since the seventh century. So that's the way we are. Does India have any problem with bigotry? You ever heard of the caste system? You know what the caste system means? Caste is a term for your skin color, a different caste. And so the native guys were lighter than the incoming darker guys. So the caste, they put them down here. Makes perfect sense. All right. It's crazy, but that's the way we are. Okay. We're just that way. And so a complaint arises because, now dig this. Here's the big idea. Because they had canonized personal biases. They had smuggled individual beliefs into absolute biblical truth. And when you do that, you have departed not to the left of Scripture. Denying Scripture, you've departed to the right of making something Bible that ain't Bible. And as a result, see if this makes sense, five things happened. People are now being insulted in the church. Secondly, the faith is done violence to. What is our faith? There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor fee, fee, no, something is real good, all right? <laughs> they are all one in Christ Jesus. Christ is all and in 
all. I pray, Father, that they might be one even as we are one, I in them, thou in me, that they can be perfected in unity because everybody's the same in Christ. Right? Right. They violated it here. You guys are not on our level. How come? You speak differently. And thirdly, is there now, like you've heard earlier in Acts, taking their meals with gladness and happiness of heart? Gladness is gone. Happiness is not there. Somebody moved in, and it's sin. And there's pain. The meals were in silence now because some people are being overlooked. And another thing, there is division. People are talking. They're siding up in their particular groups. They're casting long looks at each other. We got the Hatfields and the McCoys in the church. And it's, and I tell you the worst thing, they no longer will have favor with all the people. Now everybody on the outside is going to look in and say, you know, they look a whole lot like us. We've got Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, Zealots, and you got them too. You're no different than us. Well, Ecclesiastes 10.1. A dead fly makes the perfumer's oil stink. And it does. The first century church, we talk a lot about them a lot, what a good church they were. They were. But it's not because they don't have problems. They got problems just like us. But they know how to deal with them. Matter of fact, I'm going to go speak at Dallas Seminary on Friday. I'm an old guy now, and I get to go down and talk to the young studs periodically and the seminaries, I'm going to teach this text because this is what they're going to deal with in church. Uh, what do you do with it? Well, I don't like list, but I'm going to give you six things as to what the church does. How do you, what do you do when you get a holier-than-thou attitude that becomes an obnoxious thing? In verse 2, the 12 summoned the congregation. Write down number one, when this happens, not if this happens, but when this happens, and it will. It's a common cold of the church. It's a virus, and it gets in all churches. It is our Achilles heel. It comes with the territory of lots of different people coming together in spiritual unity that is our glory. Our glory is that we overcome the basic enmity of man. But sometimes it gets out of the bag. And so the first thing is the leaders deal with it. It is officially dealt with by the leaders of the church. And they deal with it in the Barney Fife method of leadership. When do you nip it? In the bud. That's in the book of Habakkuk. And it's, or it ought to be, all right. They deal with it quickly. You know why you have to deal with it quickly? Because it's deadly. It is stage four cancer. And you better excise it. If you find it on Friday, you better get it out on Saturday. Because it's ugly and it smells and it'll stink your church up when you get this kind of division. Uh, churches do have division between those that are willing to learn and those who don't. Those that want to obey, those who don't. Those who serve God, those who don't. That's a good division. It's calling guys upward. But whenever you get a division, of a horizontal one of guys thinking they're better than other ones because of some clothing they wear or some kind of dialect they have or where they're from, now you've got a problem. And so... The leaders deal with it quickly. I tell young guys that are in ministry, I've said to them, y'all are all prepared to deal with heresy in your church. 
Y'all have your knives sharpened, your sabers drawn, and you're ready for a bloodletting on cults, on Pelagians, on Arians, on guys that, on Unitarians, on Deists. Man, you're ready to jump on them. We haven't had a problem in our church in 40 years with cults. Or, any, or y'all know what an Arian is? It's a guy that denies the deity of Christ. They, they, they can't coexist here. When, when Bible's taught, they don't coexist. And so, and, and cults, you don't have a problem with them because they got a big crazy sign on them. I'm crazy, I'm crazy. And it just goes like this. You know, you don't have to worry about them, okay? As soon as they open their mouth, everybody goes, beep, 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 sprinklers come on, all kind of stuff. SWAT guys drop out of the <laughs> deal. So we're, when cults come, we're ready. We don't have a problem. They, they get self-dealt with before they get out the door. But it's not those that depart from the left that get you in trouble. It's not guys that deny essential truth. It's those that affirm what the Bible doesn't. It's departing to the right. A Sadducee departs to the left, denying the resurrection. A Pharisee departs to the right by saying that tradition and culture is true. That is when it gets ugly right there. Now, whenever you canonize biases, whenever the unbiblical becomes biblical, the personal becomes absolute, now you have division, and it's an ugly division. Uh, and I say to young guys, because they all feel like I'm going to be ready to deal with you know, eating food sacrificed to idols, all right? And you will be. Anytime a guy comes in offering food sacrificed to idols, you'll be ready to deal with it. But you probably aren't going to have a lot of problem with that. You will have a problem with the elasticity of other problems where people canonize what isn't biblical. Now you say, can that happen in our church? Let's have a split. Homeschool. What do y'all think about that? I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands. A lot of y'all homeschool because you feel secular school is the mark of the beast. Okay. A lot of you secular school and shouldn't homeschool. Uh, we did both. What should you do? We got guys that will die for it. Have we ever had a seminar on the uh, superiority of homeschooling? Nope. You know why? I won't let it come. I don't need the division. We have no problems in our church over schooling or homeschooling. And we're not going to have any. So you don't let it get out. It can be a problem, though. How about, let's talk birth control. Some of you did not do birth control. You're sitting in a, in a crowd of eight right to where you are, right there. <laughs> and that's all well and good. Uh, some of you uh, have got your 2.5 children. Uh, I had 2.5, and uh, that's all well and good. I had a guy come want to do a seminar in our church on the rhythm method of normal of birth control. I mentioned that to my staff. Jim Hill thought that it meant a one and a two and a one. And I said, no, that ain't what it means. So a guy wanted to do a seminar on uh, normative natural birth control, and I said, no, you can't do it. He said, you don't believe in it? I said, sure, I believe in it, and you're not going to do it because you're going to put everybody on a guilt trip and you're going to blow in, blow up, and blow out and leave me with about 400 mad women. <laughs> All right. And I'm not going to have that. So, no, we have had no problems in our church on birth control. And we got guys on both ends as to what you can do, what you shouldn't do, and that will not be discussed, not publicly. You can visit with it privately all you want, but I'm not going to let a problem get out on that. We got its personal belief, whatever you think. You do what you want to do, live and let live. Leave everybody else alone. How about holidays? How many of y'all keep Halloween? Oh, we would never do such an evil thing. Uh, I did growing up. We didn't call it Harvest Festival either. 
No, I had a Satan mask. I had a witch and a hobo and a darned uh, werewolf. Oh, yeah. Still, my boys would dress up like druids and go out and sacrifice in the, in the neighborhood. <laughs> That's how I grew up. We had skeletons. I mean, real ones. We'd put out, <laughs> put a dead body out in August. And uh, <laughs> Halloween, we had a skeleton. Oh, how terrible. You know what? We have not had one single problem in this church. I've never had one kid come up to me and say, you know, my life was doing real good until trick or treat, and then I became a drug addict. I've never had that happen. So if you don't want to do Halloween, don't do Halloween, but don't bother nobody else. Uh, oh, I, we got guys that won't do Easter. That's all well and good. My family did Easter growing up. I mean, the whole eggs and, and chickens, and I believe we had an altar to Baal, if I remember correctly, in the backyard. <laughs> How about medications? If you're going through depression, anxiety, can you take medications? You say, no, I would never do that, which tells me you ain't never been through anxiety or depression. Because you go through it and someone says you need to take rat dung, you will take rat dung, my friend. <laughs> You will raise your own rats. <laughs> so, can we do a seminar on uh, the evils of uh, SSRIs? No, you can't. If you don't want to do it, don't you do it. But don't you bother nobody else. Live and let live. It ain't in the Bible on this. Trust me, I'm real smart. Been seminary, know all kind of long words, like delicatessen and uh, <laughs> substantia, all that stuff. All right. How about we had a woman did a seminar once in our church and said, if you're a woman that works outside the home, you are in sin. And then she left, and guess who was left holding a, uh, a bag full of wolverines? <laughs> Skunk boy right here. And I said, madam, your study just ended, all right? We have no problems ostensibly on that, and we're not going to have any. So no, you don't get to preach that. How about uh, music? Oh, yeah, we got guys that will not sing a song written after 1930 in this <laughs> congregation. That's your deal. Don't bother nobody on it. How about loans? We do not take loans, really. Well, that's all well and good if you can do that. But don't bother nobody else on this. How about Sunday school? There's a big movement in our country that not to do Sunday school, not to have youth groups, that you have chaos to the glory of God, all right? And we're not going to do that. If you hold that, hold that. But we're not going to let you create a split in the church over that issue. How about dating? Our girls, our boys won't date. We're just going to line it up, a little house on the prairie, all right? <laughs> Fine, you do that. Don't bother anybody else that doesn't. How about movies? How about drinking? I don't touch a drop. I don't. But you're not going to get teetotaling from the Bible. Trust me. Don't try to make wine grape juice. <laughs> it ain't going to work. All right. So, if you're going to drink a beer... After you mow the lawn, that's all well and good, Vicky. All right. <laughs> but don't be quaffing, you know, in the fellowship hall in there. You remember Mel when you were, you said you were young. I see Mel in the back. You went and mowed your lawn on a Sunday. Remember that? And there was some old nasty skinny-legged man across the street that jumped all over him for breaking the Sabbath. All right. Causing trouble. Can you jog on the Sabbath? Some of you have a problem with it. I don't. Don't bother anybody on this. How about AA? 12-step. A lot of guys see that. No, that's a mark of the beast. We got all kind of guys that have been get, got off of alcohol drugs through 12-step. They bring a Christian twist to it. But don't be trying to alienate that thing and put it over here in, in an evil category because you can't do it. 
And so I tell young guys, you're all ready for the cults. This is what you're going to have to deal with. Hey, we had a war probably about 25 years ago on the issue of breastfeeding versus Similac. We had women going to war on that. And uh, we said we have had no problems and we will have no problems. We will not have any studies on the whatever's of the whatever. You do what you want to do and leave everybody else alone. And you put the children to bed nice and safe. Because you, know, you don't have people coming in and trying to establish a biblical something that isn't in the Bible. Well, you live and you left live. Now, I have to make sure that you understand something. Are we, does this hold with biblical maxims? No. The bot, you don't get to take off and abandon your mate for another. Amen? You don't. That's not a cultural issue. It's a biblical issue. You don't get to sleep around. That is not a cultural issue. That's a biblical issue. Uh, heterosexuality, same sex, sorry, that's a biblical issue. I don't care what the Supreme Court says. We are the church, and so that's a biblical issue. You don't get to beat your wife. You don't get to beat your husband. All right? Stop it. That's a biblical issue. You don't get to cheat in business. If we find out, we're the church. Amen? We're the church. They cheat all day out there. You don't cheat in here, though. And that's not an opinion issue. That's an absolute. And so don't confuse absolutes with culture, but don't confuse culture with absolutes. You live and let live. Well, the next point here, I've beat that horse sufficiently dead. In verse 2, you, that the leadership must secondly put its foot down. They summon the congregation. It is not desirable for us to neglect the word in order to serve tables. We are going to serve tables. What that means is a committee that is going to organize this. So he says, we are going to take care of those widows. You may have a problem with that, but we're not going to have a problem with that. We are going to deal with that problem. And so, make a note, your culture ends where the Bible begins. We got a guy in our congregation named Manny Desai. His grandfather was one of the leaders of the Indian church in his area. And in India, you can become a Christian and there's no problem unless your Christianity breaks the caste system and you start eating with darker people that are the untouchables. And Manny's grandfather said, no, that may be in our culture for 3,000 years B.C., but it just ended. Whenever I came up from the baptismal waters, it just ended. We're going to be unified in Christ. And he took a hit in ostracism for doing that because culture ends where the Bible begins. And so they put their foot down. This is a classic case of binding on earth what shall have been bound in heaven. Are we all equal and unified and one in Christ in heaven? Yes, we are. And so you can't bring divisions on earth. So that will change. And they changed it. And in verse 3, you see another point, or rather in verse 2, this is another point. We will neglect the word of God if we have to do this. This kind of division becomes kudzu, and it eats up your church, and you lose your focus. No longer can the leaders be involved in evangelism and discipleship because they're waiting tables. See, the church is a ship. Your, your framework of the ship is called doctrine in the Bible, the truth. That's the structure. And then the sail is called prayer. The wind is called the Holy Spirit. The crew is called pastor, elders, staff, and Christians are the crew that man the ship. The gospel message is the cargo. But you know what the rudder and the wheel is? 
That's the church purpose of evangelism and discipleship. You've got to stay on heading. And we're not going to get distracted and be taken over by the homeschooling issue, the drinking issue, the dress code issue. Live and let live. We're going to preach the word, make disciples, and do evangelism and discipleship. And so leaders have to keep the church on point. Another point in, num- in verse 3, at some times you delegate, brethren select from among you seven men. And so to preserve direction, you now delegate. This is the first time the church organizes. You don't organize until you have to organize. You want to travel light in the church. And this is the prototype of what the deacon will be. It's a guy that does physical job, a physical job, so the leaders can carry on the spiritual guidance of the church and not be involved in doing all the weed eating and the like. That these guys can do it. Uh, And also notice that as they keep the main thing, the main thing in verse 3, this is the first qualification of the characteristics of a leader. He has to be of good reputation with God. A leader, this is your first prototype deacon and prototype elder in time. It's like the basic formation embryonic stage. But this guy, he doesn't have to be rich, doesn't have to be famous, doesn't have to be handsome, but he does have to be of good reputation morally. I tell guys when I make them elders, I'm about to present you to 4,000 people. And if there's one guy out there, you haven't paid your bill. If there's one guy that has seen you be abusive to your wife and he comes to me, we're going to have to deal with it. So you're going to have to be 4,000 out of 4,000 before we set you forth. And so he has to be of good reputation. And secondly, he has to be full of wisdom in the Holy Spirit. In context, that's talking about sensitivity. We don't need leaders just to bring an ax down and make rules. You have to work with people. And you're going to have to be sensitive. Now that's a good picture of a leader. He has to be dogmatic in his morality and his doctrine, but he has to be able to work with humans out there and deal with them. In verse 3, we will put them in charge of the task, meaning that we will lay hands on them and we are going to give them a badge. They're not just guys operating on their own. They're underneath the auspices of the church. And I want to show you something interesting. In verse 4, everything stays hunky-dory. In verse 2 and 3, we're going to take care of the widows. In verse 4, we will devote ourselves to prayer and then to the preaching of the word. Question, does the church stay on point? Say yes. Yes. Does the church still take care of the cultural issue? Yes, they do. And so they took care of it in four sentences. And that's what you do. Organize good men, take care of this issue. Notice what they didn't do. They did not let the controlling majority of the church make the rules because of their personal pressure and bias. Did y'all just hear what I said? The elders, I'm sorry, the apostles didn't let the controlling majority and the oldest members of the church control them because of their majority numbers and their pressure. Leaders can't do that. Question, were the apostles Hellenists or were they native Hebrews? They're native Hebrews. So they did not side with their buddies. What did they side with? God. You dig? That's called leadership. When you stand up and you bring the standard, nope, that's not going to happen. We, I don't care, friends, if you do think less of these guys. We're not going to do that. Well, Paul, there's, or Peter, there's 5,000 of us, and there's 27 of them. I don't care. 
we're not democratic in that sense. People don't rule. God rules. God says we're equal, and we're going to take care of those guys. Now, that's what leaders have to do. That's why they're called leaders. Uh, but are we going to do it? No, we're going to organize, and we're going to lay hands on you, and you're going to do what we want you to do. We're not going to have apostles and then rogue prototype deacons. Y'all are going to carry out what we want carried out. We're going to have a unanimity of authority, a unanimity of philosophy of ministry. You get it done. But I want those ladies fed and taken care of. That's leadership. I want you to be strong, but I want you to be able to give. We're dealing with Vulcans out there. There's different kind of peoples. You can't be strong-armed in how you're going to do things. You've got to work with people. Well, show you something interesting in verse 5. The statement found approval with the whole congregation. It just seemed like they, everybody with the Spirit of God said, yes, that's the way a church is. Everybody can put their finger in the wind and go, yeah, amen. Now we'll have the best of all worlds. We'll take care of these ladies. We'll stay on point. We'll come up with some new leadership and a new generation. But in verse 5, notice this. They chose Stephen. That's a Greek, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. There was a leader among them. They found Philip, that's a Greek, Prochorus, a Greek, Nicanor, a Greek, Timon, I think that's also the uh, weasel in the Lion King or something like that. Uh, was he a weasel? He wasn't a weasel. What was he? A meerkat. You watch movies, don't you? <laughs> and then Parmenas, a Greek, Nicholas, let me give you a little sermon on sermon. Nicholas, he is a Gentile that becomes a Jew that becomes a Christian. The second century on had a theory on Nicholas. Y'all ever read in the book of Revelation about a cult that started called the Nicolaitans? They were a Gnostic cult. And church history says, and you have to, you didn't get the weight of scripture, but of history that that was Nicholas, that leadership went to his head, which uh, even if you do something that is the right thing, hard things can come out of it sometimes. We don't know, but it, it's an interesting idea. But in verse 5, those are all Greeks. Now, let me close with this because that's a puzzling notion. If it had been me, and most guys, we would have stepped in and said, I want some prototype servants, deacons, to take care of the feeding of these widows. We're not going to have people condescended upon because of where they're born, their zip code. That's not going to happen. Because of their dialect, because of how they dress. No, that's not going to happen. And then I would have said, I'm going to choose the Hebrews that are going to do this. I'm going to stuff bias down your throat. And you're going to do different whether you like it or not. That's what I've done. Because I'm an idiot. That's not what they do. They do what a lot of us would call a compromise. I want you Greeks to take care of your own. That way we'll be assured of putting this problem to rest and these ladies will be taken care of. Well, is there still the possibility that these native Hebrews will not mature? Yeah. If we forced them to do it, would that change anything, you think? I don't think so. It's just going to have explosions. Sometimes you do the best you can do and let the people mature on their own. I had a guy tell me one time that one of the great jobs of a leader is not bringing about perfection in the church because we still have here native Hebrews that need to grow up. Amen? We still got native Hebrews that need to grow up. We got Greeks taking care of Greeks. So in a sense, we still have a, a division 
but we have defused it. The complaint has ended. The apostles have spoken. Leadership has stayed in continuity. We didn't have divisive sex. These guys are over these guys that carry on the unity of the grace of God and the matter was taken care of. And sometimes leaders just put the children to bed where there's peace and quiet. And they did. But you know what's going to be interesting? In the next chapter, we're going to have a guy that starts preaching and he will take the gospel a step further than the native Hebrews would take it. He's going to say, God does not dwell in a house made with hands. And the new body is not the temple of God, it's the body of Christ. The native Hebrews wouldn't go that far. You know why? Because I think they were native Hebrews. And this was their temple. These new guys are going to have a courage and a clarity that the old guys didn't have. Who's the most famous Hellenistic preacher? Stephen. A Greek. And then we're going to have a guy in chapter 8 that's going to go down to Samaria. We're not just going to be in Hellenistic Jews. We're going to be in half-breed Jews. The Hatfields are going to the McCoys now. We're going to the Samaritans. You know who's going to take it to the Samaritans? Philip. Verse 5. Philip. That's not Philip the apostle. It is Philip the deacon. The evangelist. He is going to have a clarity on the gospel and the inclusiveness of grace that the 5,000 in Jerusalem don't have. Can God bring great things from young, new guys? Yes, he can. And the old guys had to figure it out. So what were the lessons of this text? Number one, be careful of bringing your biases into the church. My father-in-law, my wife's daddy, he was in a church in... You, you got a minute? Okay, I'm, I'm dedicating these last 10 minutes to, to Dee Dee Bitten. So anybody want to refuse her at this time? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, my father-in-law, they, they live out in East, way out Longview, Marshall. As you drive in East Texas, you go back in time. It's like a time machine, Okay. <laughs> By the time you get to Longview, Marshall, you're about 1840. And uh, they started seeing in their church growth and blessing. And my wife, sitting back there with Mel, she started bringing one of her African-American pals from Campus Crusade named Tasha. And then they started seeing with some other African-Americans. And pretty soon, some black folks started showing up to this white church. And they were having a church meeting and an old guy that was born in like 1740 <laughs> said, you know, we've got these folks coming to church. They've got a church to go to. What are they doing here? And all of a sudden, there was kind of a quiet moved into that room and a, a, a stench of grace that had gone sour. And my father-in-law, one of the three greatest men I've known, passed away about 15 years ago. He stood up and he said, uh, in that quiet voice of his, he said, we're Christians. And Christ knows no bounds. And we are not a church run by us. We're run by Christ. And I don't care who comes here. They are as welcome here as we are. And this guy stood up. They were the two old patriarchs. And their eyes met. And then you could hear him leave the room. Open the door. Now this guy had three generations buried in the church cemetery. But he's leaving. And my father-in-law said, hold the door. Meaning show him out. When when. When your bias clashes with Christ, you lose. 
And that church knew blessing after that. So sometimes you have to have strong leadership. And that's what Spock would have said. Captain, if you're going to do this, you better have some boys in place that have some sand in them. Number two, uh, grace is to be honored. You don't bring biases and biases immediately are dealt with. Grace will rule. Number three, biases can divide you, disturb you, and they can discredit you and distract you. Number four, leaders have to be firm. They have to be wise to know how to delegate and deal with the problem, not just ax it. Because we're not going to get rid of all 5,000 other people. We're going to have a standard. And so they are firm, they are wise, and they are sensitive. Give me some guys that can handle this well and let them be full of the Holy Spirit. And last, you stay on direction. And now in chapter 8, boom, the church is going to take off. Had they not dealt with this, it would have died right there, stillborn. It had never gone off. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we're going to deal with this because we have lots of humans. And as Paul goes to Galatia and Cyprus and Antioch of Syria, as he goes to Asia and Ephesus, as he goes to Europe and Philippi, as he goes down into Macedonia and Thessalonica, as he goes down into Greece and Corinth and Athens and on to Rome and then to Spain, up into Illyricum and, and Yugoslavia, as he penetrates these areas, all different kind of diet codes are going to come together, ruled by the grace of God. And so I pray that our body might reflect young and old, north and south, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, that there would be all types of people that come to a Jewish Savior. Just as you promised to Abraham, in your seed shall all the nations be blessed. Amen.